So when I decided to testify against my father, I knew it was going to change my life. Okay, the hardest part is one part I am my father's protector and the other part I'm my father's executioner. When I decided to do what I was going to do, it wasn't like that. This was thought out. This was in the making. That, that letter I typed was in the making for 20 years. I didn't see any way out. I knew this was going to change my life. It hurt me, but it was about survival at this point. It's not about doing the right thing, being a mouse. It's about survival. I have two young kids' mouths to feed. This man is either going to kill me or I'm going to kill him. For loan sharking, we had a lot of business people needed cash right away. I mean, back then you go to a bank, it's 30, 60 days. We had a lot of guys that dealed in a lot that, that were very successful in life, but they might have just wanted ten, twenty thousand dollars right away. They'll probably pay it back in a month or two. You know, and with them we'd charge them a closing cost, maybe twenty dollars a thousand. You know, and again we'd give them a better a deal. So you know, like the average was ten percent a week, five hundred twenty percent a year. But for businessmen, people like that, we do two and a half percent. Sometimes, uh, and then if you worked for us, that two and a half percent, you would get one percent, or we give it to you for one percent, and you can give it out to, for whatever you want. Every week when you turned money into me, I started a bank for you on the top of the card. And that bank would be, I'd take $25, $50, $100, depending on what you were bringing in, and I'd hold it in case one of your people go bad, at least you got it, because you're responsible for it as a uh, agent from us. So yeah, it was a business. And he tried to treat it like a business. Now, if you're literally screwing us and you're out there, and we find out you're gambling with other people, you're blowing money, you're not taking care of it, the first thing might be a crack to the side of the head. And somebody's standing over you telling you cut it out, you know, get the message. Sometimes it might be, you know, cutting your car tires. There were times for big money that they took it as far as killing a family animal or something and putting it on the hood of their car. You know, to the point where they're literally just gonna kill you because Enough is enough. You are not in the long run ever going to be able to walk away from not paying a debt without anything happening. If it got to the part of physical, it was the part of most of the time getting a crack to the head, or getting, you know, beat up a little bit, but nothing bad. It, 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 my father was very business like that until it got to a certain point where the only way that this person is going to understand through, through physical violence or actually getting rid of them if you know you're not going to get the money from them. In Chicago, unlike New York, over the years, the Chicago was in the outfit um, in, in organized crime. They were getting away from the, the um, violence in Chicago, unlike New York, where even in the 90s you had the Colombo War and the Gambinos killing everybody. Um, in Chicago, they were trying to get away from violence. And also, you don't bring your kids into this life. You make a better life for your kids. So I grew up in an Italian neighborhood. In Elmwood Park. In my neighborhood, a lot of my friends' fathers were in the light, just like my father, just like my uncle. But because they weren't supposed to bring us in, we really didn't know a lot was going on. We weren't hanging at corners in front of social clubs and stuff. Chicago was more underground. So as a young kid growing up, my dad never brought the street into the home. He kept it out. So I knew my father was different than a lot of the other fathers. But, um, you know, I didn't care. Okay, me and my friends, we're playing sports. We're going to go to college. I wanted to be a lawyer. So growing up, I idolized my father. I loved my father as a young kid. 
I seen this life start to change my father. And it changed my father for the worse. And, and, and my father developed, started to develop multiple personalities. So there was a side to my father. If you knew about my father, you would love him. You know, Christmas was his favorite holiday. Everybody in the neighborhood loved him. Then there was this, this street side to him. He was very, he was, I called him a master criminal. He was very good at what he did. He was a master manipulator too. Great thief, tough, and knew how to make money. And then there was a third side of my father who was a sociopathic killer that I learned years later. His preferred method of killing you was with a rope and a knife. He'd strangle you and once he knew you were dead, he'd cut your throat from ear to ear. My dad liked hands on. He said anybody could pull the trigger. He said, but I wanted up close. It was, almost, it was almost like he enjoyed what he did. Um, and over the years, we watched these personalities start to change my dad, start to blend together with family members. We've seen my dad getting more um, paranoid, more um, controlling, and more violent with family members. And sometimes we didn't even know what dad we were dealing with. So things started to change. Now, myself, my dad, his intention was not to bring me in this life nor was he supposed to. His intention was, son, I'm gonna teach you about the street. You're gonna learn street smarts and then you're gonna to go to school and learn book smarts. If you learn a little bit about both, you're gonna be very successful in life. So he would give me these little tasks to do. Go pass a few messages, some book work. I mean, honestly, I wasn't that good in school, but all my math, I learned on the street through, through loan sharking. But the problem was, I looked at this as, as, as my dad giving me chores. You know, do this for your dad, be a good son. I get it done so I can go play sports, go to school. The problem was, the more I did for my dad, the more he seen of him in me and started bringing me further into this. Got to the point one day where I bought into this. But I didn't buy into the mafia, the outfit. What I bought into was family. I bought into my dad, I bought into my uncle. I idolized these guys and I loved these guys. If my dad told me that brown wall was green, it was green. Because my dad wouldn't stare me wrong. My Uncle Nick. My Uncle Nick came out of the Navy. My Uncle Nick was kind of like an older brother to me because I was the oldest of three boys. My Uncle Nick got in his life through my dad, but my Uncle Nick was more of a soldier. You know, sometimes you can, you can, you can stand next to somebody and you can, know, you can just feel that that person's evil. My Uncle Nick never killed out of jealousy, paranoia, or for money. He killed when he was ordered to because he believed what my father was bringing it into him. And he also really didn't know what he was getting into. But once you're in, you're in. So as, as my dad is changing and I want out of this life, my dad starts to realize this and um, I, uh, I'm trying to break away from my dad. My dad winds up trying to kill me one day. He, he brings me somewhere under the ruse that we're going there for a different reason. Once he gets me in there, he grabs me by the neck, puts a gun in my face. Now my dad was not the kind of guy to scare you. You know, he always said, if you pull a gun on somebody, you make sure you follow through with it or it's gonna come back to haunt you. I don't know how or why that day, but I got out of that garage and um, you know, when he put that gun in my face, all I thought was, oh my God, he set me up. I never thought I could be set up. I started crying and using trigger words. And I'm trying to hug my dad and stay close. Dad, I'm your son. I love you. I've done everything you ask. Why are you doing this? He said, if I can't control you, I'd rather have you dead. You disobey me and you're uncontrollable. But don't worry, I'll come to your grave and pay you my respects. From that day on, I could never trust my father again. When my father found out, it was probably the worst day of my life because now he owned me. He says, I own you, I own your wife, I own my, your kids. You report to me three times a day. Your life from this point on is mine. At that point, I thought my life was over. What did I do? What mistakes I made? I got these two little kids.
indicted for an earlier case. Me, my brother, my uncle, and my dad, and seven other co-defendants for running a loan sharking operation, one of the biggest ones in the city from the late 70s to the early 90s. I thought this was gonna be my way out. Prison was gonna be my way out to change my life and get away from my dad. And I figured, you know, unconditional love, this is my dad, he's gonna see this crisis, step forward, lead us through this, we're gonna change our lives. So I get in, I'm in uh, uh, Metropolitan Correctional Center in Chicago. I'm going to trial, I violated my bond. Um, and I'm going to trial. I'm not trial, I'm, I'm pleading out, we're all pleading out. And I find out that I'm going to the same prison as my dad in Milan, Michigan. And I freaked out. I said, this is not gonna work. My dad is going to ruin everything here. I wanna change my life. I just wanna be away from my dad. I don't care about jail. And I'm deciding what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do, what am I gonna do? Do I wait till we get home? My dad's gonna kill me when we get home on the street. So what's my other option? Now the only thing I could come up with was the worst thing you could do in my neighborhood, be a snitch, be a rat. But I'm not having a problem doing my time. That's usually for guys that can't do their time. So you know what? I got an idea. So I went to the prison library. I says, I am gonna work out a business deal with the government. So I got on the, on the library typewriter with winter gloves on for no fingerprints. I typed it for no handwriting. Didn't write nothing personal in there. And after eight months of being with my dad trying to work it out, I sent this letter to the FBI. In the letter it said, look, nobody can know that I'm talking to you, especially not my lawyer, because the lawyer was all mobbed up. I feel like I have to help you keep this sick man locked up forever. A no recording device has just come out with pen and paper. And when they came out, we sat down and um, I started working with them. A lot of people ask me, these wires, you know, how hard was it to wear a wire on a prison yard? The warden didn't want to okay it. The government was button heads with the warden because it's like, this kind of stuff doesn't go on in prison. This is too dangerous. But through a court order at the last minute, we were able to do it. Now, my dad's a very smart street guy. How do I get my dad to talk? So when the government first came, I said, look, I don't want to wear a wire. He's too smart for that. He caught guys like that on the street. I'm going to feed you information. It's called dry beefing and I'm gonna point you in the right direction. You think you had us, you ain't even touch the tip of the iceberg. After thinking about it, I says, I gotta wear a wire, I gotta get my dad in his own words. He's too smart for this. So I told him I'll wear a wire, but here was my concerns. You know, and um, I, I, that when they came to the prison, they couldn't dress like FBI agents. If anybody's seen it, I'm in big trouble. And I gave them some ideas, which I, I don't talk about publicly, about the kinds of wires to make because I'm in prison. They go to Quantico, they come back with these James Bond type wires. And we go out there. Now beside all that, I have to incriminate the smartest guy I know on the street, my dad. So what do I use? I use what he taught me. Know your enemy's strength and weaknesses. Anger and liquor get people to talk. Pit one person against another. I pit my dad and my uncle against one another. My uncle was bad mouthing my dad on the street for not sticking up for my younger brother, Kurt, who was innocent in this case. I got my dad so mad on these tapes, I got my uncle, that not only did he open up and talk about all this stuff, he actually gave his blessing to have my uncle killed in another prison. These, these, um, these meetings were hard with my dad because first of all, the danger level was off the charts. The FBI couldn't monitor me because it's all concrete in the prison. So I left this office with these wires on. Either I came back anywhere from an hour to five hours later or the prison alarm went off on the yard and I was dead. Came down to the last recording, we were having some technical difficulties, um, and I had to wear a different wire that wasn't a good one. And uh, I thought my dad had almost caught it, and at that point the government had, had enough, and I got transferred out to another prison to finish my time, and I came home. So that's how I started cooperating against my dad.
So when I decided to testify against my father, I knew it was going to change my life. Okay, the hardest part is one part I am my father's protector and the other part I'm my father's executioner. When I decided to do what I was going to do, it wasn't like that. This was thought out. This was in the making. That, that letter I typed was in the making for 20 years. I didn't see any way out. I knew this was going to change my life. It hurt me, but it was about survival at this point. It's not about doing the right thing, being a mouse. It's about survival. I have two young kids' mouths to feed. This man is either going to kill me or I'm going to kill him. Now, six years had passed since I last seen my dad, you know, wearing a wire against him, going to visit him in prison, and getting into the courtroom. That day I walked in the courtroom, this is not a joke to me, this is, this is serious. When I walked in that courtroom and see my dad, I was overcome with emotion. I looked over and I said, that's my dad, I love my dad. I wanted to go over there, I wanted to run, I wanted to hug him, I wanted to say, Dad, enough, we gotta cut out this craziness. Come on, you're going home and you're gonna get away from this stuff. But as soon as he looked at me with those struts, I knew why I was there. After one week of sleepless nights of testifying against him on the stand, I got off that stand, I looked at my dad one last time long, I walked in another room, tears came out of my eyes. One of the prosecutors walks in and said, what happened, somebody threatened you or something? I says, you know how sick and sad this is? I know in my heart that's the last time I've ever seen my dad alive, and it was. And yes, it's always been hard. Like I said, this is not about right and wrong. This is, this is, it was about survival. It wasn't about doing my time. I did my time. When I made the deal with the government, I made the deal, do all my time, pay all my fines, no immunity. I just wanted them to help me to keep my dad locked up forever. Growing up with my Uncle Nick, he was like an older brother to me. We were very close. He was very close with me and my brother. The hardest part I ever had to do in life was implicate my uncle in this one murder. Now, my uncle was to the point where he had enough of my dad with my dad. I do believe that my uncle at some point was ready to testify against my dad. Uh, that being said, that was his decision. Okay, that would be his decision in the long run. But for me, um, the hardest thing I ever had to do was implicate my uncle because in order to get my father, it, I, I had to tell about the, the uh, bloody glove and the gun that I retrieved and all that. So I, I, by implicating me, I had to implicate my uncle and, in, and by doing that, I was able to implicate my dad in all this. So my relationship with my uncle now is, you know, he knows that had this not happened and we got out on the street, we would have either been killed by who was left in the mob or we would have been in some kind of uh, some kind of altercation with my dad. So he understood what I did. Um, he not he did not think that he was going to. I mean, he actually, as a cooperating witness, got the most time ever for what he did. Normally, cooperating witnesses at his level would, you know, once the case was over, they'd be let out. Guys like Sammy the Bull and all that. Um, we work on our relationship. Me and my uncle have talked, and we're still working on that relationship. I mean, it's just, it, it, every, all this ripped our family apart. So yeah, it was, that was the hardest thing I ever did. I mean, my uncle never did nothing to me. He actually saved my life. In the murder that I implicated him, I was supposed to be part of that. That was kind of like making my bones. And I was ready, this man had done stuff to our family, even though he was a friend at one time. My uncle stopped it because he didn't want me to cross this line with my dad and the mob. He's seen the way we're changes. So he did it alone. And that's how he wound up shooting himself in the struggle 
Okay, and that's how that all happened. Had I been in that car with him, none of that would have happened. So not only did he save me from crossing that line, and it was a huge turning point in my life, but then I also implicated in him, him in it. So that was very hard. And um, yeah, and, and I'm not making an excuse for it. It's what I had to do, and it's what I did. I, I think um, you know my uncle has got a second chance at life. And he spends it with his family, and um, and I yeah I, I wish him the best and everything. And we're slowly working on our our relationship. After the trial, I had a pizza place. I grew up making pizza. I love pizza. Always had jobs all my life. I started sixth grade, my first job as a newspaper out. And I think that's what saved me. So. I had a pizza place in Phoenix, and it was doing very well. I was ready to expand. I should have waited till after the trial. Once the trial came out, there were news trucks all over the place. The people that owned the strip center wanted me out. Kind of legally extorted me out. I had a, uh, an option, a three-year option in my lease. They said, we're not going to expand. We're not going to do nothing. I closed everything down, and uh, I went to work for Marriott. I've been working for Marriott since 2007, off and on. A couple of years ago, I went back to Chicago to see my mother for her birthday in the summer when it was slow. I wound up opening up a, a, a tour business in Chicago. So what I do now is I'll take you around in Chicago, I'll show you the different sites, and I'll tell you about the history of organized crime dating all the way back from my grandfather fought against Al Capone up to this trial, up to about 2012, 2013 in, in the state of organized crime in Chicago now. In 1986, in September, I was supposed to, this was supposed to be my first kill. Okay, the man that I wanted to kill, John Ficarata, he had, he had done a few things to our family. And when my father got the order to kill him, I said, Dad, let me do it. I said, this is not about the mob stuff, this is about our family stuff. I'm 26 years old at the time. And, um, you know, this is when I was ready to step up. And I would have did it, had my dad at any point during that time told me I had to kill somebody, I would have did it for him. Uh, I would have never had any obligation because most people didn't know how deeply involved I was outside my dad and my uncle, except a few people in our crew. So I would have never gotten an order. If my dad got the order and asked me to assist, yes, I would have done it. But my uncle, like I said, my uncle saved my life. You know, I was ready to cross that line. The problem was if I would have crossed that line on that night, I would have been obligated to my dad for life.